Thank you, everybody, and thank you for the previous presentation. My name is uh, Ruth Leach from the School of Education, and I'm accompanied in the pre my presentation today by two other members of the research team, Professor Joanne Hughes from the Centre for Shared Education and Dr Joanne Jordan um, from the University of Ulster. They will kindly contribute to the summary of the findings. The full Iliad research team is interdisciplinary and also comprises Dr Stephanie Burns, who's here today, Robin McRoberts, Dr Michael Ivers, Dr Ian Shuttleworth, Cahill McManus, Dr Christine McSherry, and it's supported by an advisory group, a young person's advisory team, team and a steering group which is coordinated by OFM, DFM who have gratefully supported us. The investigating links in achievement and deprivation research known as the Iliad study is designed as a three-year community-centred ethnographic case study or more properly a series of case studies. The research inquiry combines statistical and in-depth qualitative data to explore and contribute to an understanding the factors and dynamics that lead to differential educational achievement within and between seven ward areas in Northern Ireland. And we hope that this will be a significant input to the wider understanding of the relationship between achievement and deprivation. And we're due to submit the final report to OFMDFM at the end of March 2015. Thus, any findings, interpretations or recommendations reported today remain tentative and, and somewhat speculative. What we all know from many studies worldwide is that there's a demonstrable link between high level achievement with low educational achievement outcomes. Notwithstanding the strengths of these correlations, this study proposed that educational achievement within deprived areas may well be more complex than is suggested by quantitative studies alone. Existing studies are often large scale and they do correlate various educational outcome measures with best fit indicators or proxies for deprivation, often free school meals, which of course all remain rather slippery variables. In the Iliad study, we started very pragmatically with the official accepted definitions of the key variables of interest. For measures of deprivation, we adopt a comp the composite measure of the Northern Ireland multiple deprivation measure which comprises seven domains of deprivation, as I'm sure many of you know, each developed to measure a direct form or type of deprivation. These include income, employment, health, education, proximity to services, living environment, and crime. Definition of a neighborhood is contentious, and the most common and pragmatic solution to the definition has been to use terms associated with output geographies. We decided to use wards, Although recognising that the extent to which wards in Northern Ireland capture meaningful neighbourhoods may remain rather moot. There are 582 electoral wards geographically spread across Northern Ireland with an average population of approximately 3,000 people in any one ward. We selected seven of these. These all wards are also ranked, ranked for multiple deprivation from one, the most deprived ward, through to 582 the least deprived ward. As an indicator of educational achievement, the study primarily adopted the published percentage of GCSE rates obtained by ward area. Data for these were obtained from the Department of Education, School Census, etc. Now, we do know that Northern Ireland has a very particular set of contextual features that, in trying to explain anything as complicated as achievement and deprivation, that need to be taken account of. So we're a small nation, we're one that's still emerging from a protracted period of conflict. We also know that the system is still characterised by academic selection of children at age 11. And most children also largely attend religiously separate schools, predominantly Catholic or predominantly Protestant. Only 7% attend integrated schools. And many schools are also separated by gender. So for GCSE and A-level, what we also know is that we are consistently top or close to the top in the UK. The tail of underachievement, however, tends to be longer than average. Whilst the revised GCSE curriculum and examinations appear to work well for 96% of grammar school pupils and 44% of non-grammar school pupils, who, for example, in 2012, achieved five or more GCSEs at grade A star to C, there still is an issue about the extent to which the remainder are able to derive much benefit in terms of success and achievement. So in 2012-13, 45% of non-grammar school pupils year 12 
were either not entered for any GCSE subjects or achieved less than three passes at grade A to C. And we also know from the annual school census that almost 3,000 pupils left that year achieving no GCSEs. So we have an issue. Comparing ourselves in Northern Ireland with international evidence, the link between socioeconomic background and performance in Northern Ireland is weaker than most other OECD countries at primary school level, but it is, however, stronger than average at post-primary. And these patterns have been identified as policy concerns here in Northern Ireland, illustrating the extent of the gap of widening social inequality in Northern Ireland, and also the fact that so far interventions to close this gap have been largely unsuccessful. OFM DFM clearly have a 10-year strategy for children and young people, emphasising the need to improve educational progress for all. And our st Iliad study aims to inform and contribute to this evidence base. So let me just tell you where Iliad started. This scatter graph identifies the correlation or relationship between the level of multiple deprivation of neighbourhoods along the bo bottom axis and the percentage of children ob ob obtaining five or more GCSE passes along the other axis. Um, and for here, multiple deprivation measure, the higher the score, the higher the deprivation. And while there is a line of um, best fit that, oh, that you can see that seems to, to run along this, what we were also very aware of was that there were various anomalies which were or outliers which, which did not fit that pattern, did not fit the statistical pattern. There were areas of high deprivation where achievement was higher than you might expect, and there were areas of lesser deprivation where, the, where achievement was much lower than you might have expected. And variations were also evident between predominantly Catholic and predominantly Protestant areas, but also between Catholic areas themselves and between predominantly Protestant areas and between mixed religion areas. So we began to scrutinise the secondary data, the percentage of pupils achieving five or more GCSEs at grade C or above against multiple depriva deprivation measures in order to select case study ward areas that we might investigate in more depth for Iliad. And from a short list of about 20 plus potential ward areas, these seven were selected as indicative um, against criteria and judged to be those which offered the best potential for contributing answers to the emerging research questions and to allow for some within comparison and some between comparisons. So this table indicates each ward selected, its council area, the deprivation rank and the 15-year pattern of percentage GCSE results. Um, as you can see, um, we have ended up sele selecting in the sample three predominantly Catholic greens, three predominantly Protestant, I want to say pink, but it looks like red, and one mi mixed religion area gray. We felt that this sample would allow us to explore and understand the factors and dynamics contributing to differential educational achievement. They would allow also for co qualitative comparisons within wards and between wards. Now, you might want to come back to this table at some point, but, um, Sorry. This led to a series of broader research questions. So how is it that children and young people in some wards with high level deprivation perform well educationally relative to their counterparts in similar or less deprived wards? How can differential educational attainment be explained between wards that are very closely matched as regards multiple deprivation? What are the main factors and discourses or dynamics within each ward that account for, or that might account for these patterns of achievement? And also what explanatory value might be offered by a theoretical frame of social capital? I have to work backwards here somehow or other. So the design of Iliad. Moving from our secondary analysis of, of existing data, our concern was to engage in depth within each of the seven ward areas and undertake ethnographic fieldwork that would help us drill down into factors and dynamics and discourses that together might contribute to the explanations of educational achievement in each ward area. So in each ward area, the overarching questions that we asked of respondents could be characterized as, what are the aspects or issues perceived to be important in this ward area and how are these perceived to relate to educational achievement in this area? Now, it was simplified. So our interest was to obtain in the ward area the perspectives of respondents at different levels 
of, of the community, micro level, meso level and macro level. Um, the le what we've termed micro level or community grassroots level, meso level is like school level factors and macro is policy or structural level factors. So this design model permitted us to adopt a conceptual frame we felt based on, on social capital, um, which is really saying that simply that the premise is that social networks have value, that collective and individual benefits um, accrue through cooperation between people. So viewed as a resource, social capital is not just an attribute of any individual, but also an attribute of small collectives or networks of relationships such as local communities, neighbourhoods, and in this case, wards. So I think we were interested in what was going on in these wards between these three levels, but also between any one ward and either its, its neighbours or, or Northern Ireland as a whole, and how was this contributing to perhaps the, the issues that were under investigation. And as you can see, our participants relate to each of those levels, local community people, um, stu students and teachers in schools, statutory voluntary bodies, policy makers and so on. And we've drawn on m multiple sources of data collection through focus groups and interviews, which are more standard, an electronic survey with pupils, which is ongoing, as well as visual ethnographic data collection in the wards, the kind of physical structures, the built environment, the messages that are coming, because of course poor infrastructure and those kind of messages in particular spaces and places have been shown to exacerbate unequal outcomes. So what, we will, what we've got is a huge amount of data reported in March 2015 and um, what we're really going to do now is very briefly summarise We've got a thematic analysis of the qualitative data, and that's revealing a series of what we call cross-cutting factors, only a few of which we can briefly refer to today, alongside in-depth analytic case studies of each of the ward areas, which are trying to understand the factors associated uniquely within each of the ward areas. And we're going to illustrate one of those today. So recognising that each ward has its own particularities and is unique, the overarching analysis reveals the following cross-cutting themes, and Joanne Hughes is going to take us through the first of these. So I'm just going to talk in very broad terms about some of these themes, and then Joanne Jordan is going to take one of the ward areas and explore in more depth some of the themes that are emerging within that particular ward. Um, so first of all, um, the value placed on education varies. Um, what we find is that young people or what's emerging from the data is that young people tend to attain higher achievement levels when they're supported and encouraged by friends, parents and the wider community. However, it would appear that across a number of the wards that um, some young people um, not only lack this encouragement but are actively dissuaded from trying at school. According to our community respondents, teachers and indeed some of the young people themselves, this dissuasion happens at a number of different levels, including discouraging attitudes from their peers, their families, the wider community, and at some level external kind of stigmatisation of the young people based on where they're from. There's also an issue around role models. Um, it was evident, again from our data analysis, that some of the young people are dissuaded from education because of the negative influences within their own community. Several of our youth workers and parents groups felt that the young people were surrounded by negative people, negative attitudes, that um, their community um, is very divided and that within it there are too many what they call bad role models. Um, in some of these environments it was argued that young people who do well at school or go to university um, have to actually move out or at the very least keep a low profile because it's considered to be abnormal at some level. In social capital terms, the bounded solidarity of a number of the ward areas, it seems, contributes to a downward levelling of ambition. Um, the consequence of this process is that, for example, the young people absorb many of these pessimistic influences, um, for example, high unemployment, low attainment levels, negative environmental messages and less positive role models and are persuaded to view further or higher education as unattainable and minimum uh, wage work or unemployment as inevitable. So at some level, taking Borgia's notions of habitus, um, education or higher education is considered to be out with these young people's kind of sphere of, um, 
of what's normal for them. Um, so the positive job opportunities in these disadvantaged communities leads adolescents to question the long-term payoff to academic achievement and to scale back their aspirations for high levels of attainment. And for many, there's also a growing perception that the only people in these areas that succeed are the ones that do so through unlawful means. And we heard about role models being, for example, local um, drug dealers or people who are involved in illicit activity. In terms of parental capacity and engagement, <coughs> And in relation to social issues, um, key contributory factors identified across the wards um, that lead to uh, difficult community and home environments and thus directly affects educational possibilities are things like the culture of drugs, alcohol and benefit uh, uh, dependency, the issue of absent fathers, intergenerational mental health issues and insular community attitudes, many of which relate back to the legacy of the conflict. It was mentioned more than once that the biggest differences in uh, that this uh, that the biggest difference in the community since the ceasefires is the normalisation of widespread drug use and um, self -med medication. Another issue related to um, key skills or parenting skills. In fact, of all of the factors identified um, as likely to promote educational success, the role of parents was most keenly articulated. Um, alongside a supportive home environment, typically expressed in terms of parents or carers proactively encouraging or enabling their children to do well at school. Um, those involved in the provision of formal education acknowledged that their own efforts could only go so far, irrespective of the commitment of any school. <coughs> um, a child could only fully achieve their academic potential if it was supported to do so by their parents um, or their family. And while many parents actively or keenly supported their child's education, a number of issues coalesced around the impact of class-based disadvantages on a young person's support network, the correlation between essential skills deficit in parents and a child's confidence levels and their subsequent academic performance, and the impact of decreasing levels of interaction between parents and young children on their early language development, leading to deficits. In some ward areas, which we'll talk about um, later, there were some more effective models of parental support um, that um, Joanne might mention. <laughs> um, and if not, we can talk about it in the discussion. Um, another big issue um, was that of academic selection. It was a hugely contentious issue. Um, unsurprisingly, respondents from the grammar sector serving the wards that we looked at were in favour of ongoing selection, although many of them held contradictory attitudes when pressed. And so a number of the principles that we talked to, whilst at some level supported, um, acad supported academic selection, it was clear that there was a tension between that support and for many of them the kind of faith-based perspective from which they uh, articulated this support. <coughs> By contrast, um, there's a fairly broad consensus among secondary school principals parents, community spokesmen, and a number of the youth interviewed that academic selection remains a powerful inhibitor of educational achieve achievement in the ward areas. Um, and looking at the opinions that we observed on the practice of selection, um, these kind of coalesced around three key themes. Firstly, that academic selection labels those who fail um, or, to not, or who don't sit the transfer tests <coughs> as stupid or thick. Um, Secondly, that if there has to be a selection process, then that this should not take place at such an early age. And thirdly, that grammar schools are not contracting in line with demographic changes in the ward areas. And this is having a negative impact on the role of secondary schools, on the role of the enrolment of secondary schools. Several principals and teachers claimed that the biggest problem with selection was that those who either fail the transfer test or don't sit it are labelled as lacking intelligence and often internalise this identification. There was also the issue um, raised of grammar school creaming. Um, so um, it's, it's commonly argued that despite a decreasing population, grammar schools are not contracting in line with these demographic changes. And this puts pressure on non-selective schools in two ways. Firstly, falling roles in these schools makes them vulnerable to closures and amalgamations. 
And secondly, grammar schools are considered to be creaming off or taking in those pupils that they wouldn't have had before. And these pupils tend to be the ones who would have been the better able pupils in the secondary schools. And thus those role models have gone out of the secondary schools and into the grammars. And what the secondary schools are left with in some cases is dealing with um, high numbers of pupils on free school meals and those with kind of multiple um, issues that uh, a lot of teachers and um, principals spend a disproportionate amount of their time dealing with those issues vis-a-vis um, -vis educating the children. Okay, um, we have another slide of key issues, which I think um, you can kind of broadly read those there. We want to give Joanne a minute or two to talk about Dunclog. So. One of the wards that Ruth mentioned was the Dunclog ward, which is in Ballymena. Um, and I was the researcher who, I was going to say, was sent to Ballymena. I live in Ballymena. Um, so I uh, did the ethnographic field work, some of it, not all of it, uh, some of the colleagues in Dunclog. Um, and what I'm going to do, I could talk for the next 20 minutes about it, but I'm going to give you one good news. So all of the ethnographic data is distilled down into these force field diagrams. And we've got, I we, each of us developed two, one which is school-based and one which is community-based. And we could talk about all of this, but I'm going to select one thing because I think that it is routinely a resource which is one of the first things that gets cut off whenever for funding is, becomes limited or there's any issue around um, we need to cut the money. And that's youth clubs. And the, the, what was really, really apparent to me, uh, particularly because we have to work very, very hard to get the perspectives of young people themselves, it's very easy to get a principal to talk to you. It's very easy to get a teacher or a youth worker, etc. It's much more difficult to engage young people. And I spent a lot of time and energy managing to get groups of young people together. And again and again, what they told me was the importance of their local youth club on many, many levels, all to do with educational attainment at the end of the day from keeping them off the streets. Now, these are 15-year-olds who recognise this themselves from keeping them off the streets to actually physically, materially supporting them to fill in applications for further college at colleges of education, to helping them with their GCS coursework, etc. And if there's one message I want you to take away from what I've been getting out of Dunclog is that there are really strong um, facilitators or drivers of achievement at a community level and youth clubs can be one of them. <laughs>